Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Peter Bishop. He comes from uh, Houston Clear Lake, and down there he is one of the, quote, future lookers. So we will look for some future uh, Peter. I call a lot of things in my day, Bill, but futurist, futurologist, whatever, future looker is, is a new one. I'll add that to the list. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here this morning talking about the future of space. I really come to report on a uh, workshop that uh, we conducted uh, for various sponsors, uh, people interested in developing the commercial opportunities in space. And uh, this workshop is resulting in a report, which I uh, will be glad to send to you. Uh, any cards or notes that I get uh, during this morning's session, you'll get a copy of that uh, mailed out on Tuesday. The report is actually a, uh, uh, a new technique applied to the pro one of the problems we have in developing the commercial activities in space. Jim described very well and, and uh, the entrepreneurial view. But there are people in the public sector who are also interested in developing space. Uh, NASA, of course, has been charged since 1981 with, uh, the, to facilitate the commercial development of space, and they have done what they could. And the states are becoming active in that process. And this workshop was actually sponsored, as I understand it, by the first time that NASA and state organizations have combined to try and develop this, uh, this workshop, Call the Future of the Space Industry, Opportunities for Texas, was sponsored by the NASA Office of Commercial Program and two state organizations which are interested in the same objectives, the Texas Space Commission and the Texas Space Grant Consortium. We held the workshop in November of 1990, and uh, our report describes every aspect of that workshop. The workshop was really uh, pulled together to try and answer one question. What is it that could be done in the next 10-year period to facilitate the commercial development of space and indeed to begin to create a better environment for that development. Starting with the premise that you have to have products, you have to have markets, you have to have profits from those products, and investment and, and labor and technology are all necessary. What could people do that would create and help the commercial development of space? Particularly, we all know things that could be done in this conference and many other conferences are full of things. But what are the most important things? Essentially to provide some focus, a set of agenda items that, uh, that, that <coughs> companies, that individual citizens, that state agencies in the state of Texas could begin to, pr to promote uh, commercial development in Texas. This is not just a Texas program, though. This program could be applied in any state in the union. In fact, it has a lot The results are generalizable to the national program as well. One of the unique things about this workshop, though, and it was very hard to communicate it to people, is that we did not come together to talk and hear presentations. Lo and behold, we actually tried to do something different and kind of shocked everybody. We have a professor at Texas A&M University who's developed something called a, the, an impact workshop. And it's based upon a computer technique for forecasting called cross-impact analysis. This is one of any number of techniques that takes a whole number of variables and attempts to figure out what the future combination of those variables will be. The unique application that he put together, though, is that he put this technique into a workshop where the analyst or the economist or the strategist did not develop the computer, pro computer model, but actually the workshop participants did that and then use that model to decide which strategies they want to, to employ based upon those that maximize the outcome of the model. It's a very involving technique. It's one that creates a lot of interest. And this workshop went on for two and a half days, building and arguing about that type of a model. And it's a different way of approaching a problem that we all have. The participants in this workshop were also, I think, unique because we got more than 50% participants were from the business community themselves. Uh, most of us in the public sector or those who have an interest in space as private sector individuals realize that most conferences attract very few business people. Uh, I like to think they're, they're worried about uh, trying to make a living and we all have the, the, the enjoyment to be able to talk about the development of space. So you usually have a lot of space enthusiasts and, and, and National Space Society is a leading organization there and then you have the business community on the other side. Well, in this workshop, we got 55% of the participants were in actual space businesses of one form or another, from the large aerospace firms trying to market large launch vehicles to the small firms like space services and space industries. We also had our representation from government, both state and, and national, and with representation from the academic sector. 
The first thing that people did in this workshop was to try and identify what they thought the system was. What was the space business? What was the space industry? And they, they described that industry in the set of 30 different variables, just the way you would in a computer model. The interesting part in this workshop, though, that most of those variables were economic variables. Sure, we had research and development, we had education, we had public funding. But most of the variables were markets, products, profits, revenues, jobs, and all of the variables that an economic and a business view of the industry was. So I believe that we have a model of the space industry that is more attuned to the needs of business than the needs of the public or, or the academic sector. We selected three variables as the primary uh, outcome of the model itself, and those were the amount of the space industry and tech in, in, the, in the nation, which was going on in Texas, and this was a state-level focus. Secondly, how many jobs were created by the space industry in Texas, and finally, what type of profits were created by the space industry in Texas. And you can see by those three variables how business and economically oriented this particular workshop was. The most important outcome of the workshop, however, and the, and the part that, that the report really focuses on is what could be done. One can't go out and say, let's create jobs. There's nobody who knows how to do that. Let's go out and create products. Let's go out and create markets. Workshop participants, though, did identify certain variables as control variables, things which people in the workshop, if they decided to do so, could increase or decrease by policy, by intervention. And that became then the strategy, saying, you go do this, and we will have a bigger space industry in Texas or wherever. There are a list of nine such interventions, five of which are primary and came up right away, and four of which are called mitigating, or they're the ones who, which uh, actually solved other problems. The first one, and the one that we all think of, of course, is to have as much money in the space industry as possible, and government still being the biggest driver, the civilian space budget was one of the variables that was uh, thought to be extremely important. We're forecasting a bigger civilian space budget for the next decade, but that is obviously not an, an absolute uh, certainty, and therefore that, that had to be done as a policy. Three of the more interesting variables, though, that came out secondly were not public sector variables, they were private sector variables. One of them was to increase the available capital in the space industry, something Jim mentioned that, uh, that has been one of the biggest, if not the biggest, inhibitor to the development of space business is the lack of capital. Uh, secondly, to increase the number of joint ventures between government and industry, getting government and industry earlier, together earlier in the development process of technology rather than later. We've used uh, what I sometimes call the junkyard process or the secondhand store process of, of, of uh, technology uh, dissemination. And that is, once the government has developed it, then industry is welcome to it. So lo and behold, the technologies that are developed usually do not suit commercial interests. The purpose in this strategy is to try and get business and government together earlier in the technology development process to start developing technologies which are valuable to both. The government walks away with unlimited space and government use, and the industry walks away with the commercial rights to uh, commercialize that technology and space products and services. An interesting program starting that as well. And the third of these three economic variables were the incentives. Businesses locate in various parts, and this was the state level focus. Businesses locate because there's a favorable business climate. Obviously, tax incentives is the first thing that comes to mind, but that's not, the, it turns out, the most important thing. It's something in Texas you can't do very well anyway. An educated workforce is actually one of the most important incentives. And favorable uh, uh, facilities and infrastructure and, and transportation nodes and communication, all of those things are incentives which uh, people can, can work on there. The last of the fifth variable that relates directly to the National Space Society and other societies like that. none of these will happen without an adequate degree of constituency support. Unless people say that space is an important industry to develop, then these strategies will all be a nice report, but nothing in fact will happen. Those are the five primary interventions that this workshop recommended for Texas, indeed for the nation as a whole. Keep the government space budget healthy, develop capital for private sector use, work with industry earlier in the technology development process, 
provide incentives for people, much as Dr. Sanchez pointed out, to get into the space business, and last of all, keep the interest on part of the voting and the taxpaying public high, and those strategies will go forward. There were four other strategies which came up as mitigations to problems. Essentially what we did was change those variables in the model, force those to be high, assuming that the, that the agencies would go out and do those, and then what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. First of all, regulatory barriers and, and instability in national policy turned out to be a primary inhibitor to space business in the computer model. Business does not mind risk, as Jim pointed out. What they can't stand is unknown. What they can't stand are risks that change. And Congress and the executive branch, literally with the whisk of a pen, can change the whole environment, favorably or unfavorably. Business people in this workshop were saying, whatever you do, let's do it for a while, rather than continually change. And the Pure Over Space Station is, a, is, the, obvious, is the obvious example. Regulatory barriers, transportation now is pretty well out of the phase of having to deal with too much regulation. The Department of Transportation has set the regulations as long as they're known and not uh, uh, burdensome, then industry can work in there. The remote sensing industry looks like the one that is next up on the block perhaps for the 1990s. Regulatory barriers there of non-discriminatory access, regulatory barriers of, of, of who has to sell data, what type of data is available, is inhibiting com commercial development in that industry. Down the line, we'll worry about the re regulatory barriers in materials processing and microgravity processing once we have an industry there, and those will be next on the list. Last but not least, of course, were the academic and the educational necessities for new research and development and education. Frankly, those were not the most important uh, items to come up in this workshop, I think also because it was dominated by business interests. On the one hand, we accuse business people all the time of being too short-sighted, and research and development and education are definitely long-term projects and long-term interventions. On the other hand, they have a real problem because they have to be able to make money this year to stay in existence to be able to make money next year. And that research and development and education, which are two interests of mine, are not necessarily interests of the business community. And we have to continue to push those. In the end, therefore, we had nine strategies, nine things which two or three or four of the participants, business, government, academia, could go out and do if their constituencies decided to do so. The workshop closed on a very high note. People felt like they had accomplished something. They had set an agenda. They had focused the, the activity towards a specific task. The problem was that in the evaluations, everyone thought this technique was wonderful except no one thought anything would happen. How many times have you felt that yourself? Hi, we know what we're going to do, and as soon as people are onto airplanes and in their regular lives, nothing happens as a result. We took it upon ourselves, therefore, to institute a follow-up program, which we're in the midst of right now, and I can report fairly successful results, at least for the first six months of what is to be a 10-year program. We have received uh, a lot more attention from the state government in Texas for the space industry, partially as a result of this workshop. We have a new governor in Texas, in case you hadn't heard, and a legislature which is sitting under that new administration is now taking space much more seriously as an area for technology development and for commercial application. And fortunately, both of those are high on the new agenda for the new government. As a result, we're being asked to provide ideas and, and, and questions about new, uh, new things. This uh, bill, in fact, passed the, uh, the Senate last, last week, I think, the Texas State Senate, to start uh, a funding program for the Texas Space Commission, which will be the state government's organization. The commission was created two years ago, but created without funds. And now this year, our objective was to create funds. I think that is to sell the various kinds of license plates, believe it or not. I mean, we're, you know, there's no lack of good ideas in Texas, as, as Jim Davidson pointed out. But uh, the, uh, uh, the license plates may provide the funding source for some political activity. That's an example of the kind of things which workshop participants have been able to provide. We've had meetings on various follow-up activities, and I can report, if I had more time, on where those are going. Six months later, we are getting the attention in Texas for the space industry that we didn't have a year ago. And I'm proud to say that this workshop, with the kind of people that were involved, the variables they identified, and the good sensible strategies that they came up with has gotten the attention of the state and state industry, and I expect these follow-up activities to go forward. 
Let me close on a note that's the more general character, however, and the key to all of this, as the key to anything that we do in space, in a democracy, has to be the opinions of the people. Most surveys show a very high interest in space and, and large support for the space program. There are clouds on the horizon, however, that that interest, as the space station continues to be a turbulent, as the space shuttle continues to be either routine or catastrophic, whichever, you, whichever year you want to talk about, uh, the, the public's interest is thin, and we are, and we, I'm sure you are, struggling with the idea of the why question, the rationale, why should we go to space. One answer to that we may see in the 1990s draws energy from an is issues that are developing. We're in the midst of a recession right now, and the purpose of recessions is to kind of clean house, if you will, put away the old and begin the new. The old 1980s are over. We're closing the door on fast-track financial. Uh, we're closing the door on paper entrepreneurs and mergers and acquisitions. We're opening the door on a new economic competition, which in the 1990s, the US may actually respond. We have wrung our hands over Japanese manufacturing and European uh, organization. We really haven't done a whole lot about it. In the 1990s, we might begin to respond with a process that looks to various industries as the leaders, as the flagship industries for the United States economy in the 21st century. We are the beneficiaries of that type of policy in the 1920s and 30s when the government identified the aircraft industry and aviation in general as a strategic interest. And indeed, World War II and the American dominance in aerospace since then have been the legacy of that particular policy. We might propose a candidate industry in space, saying that there is now need to be laid the infrastructure, the government business cooperation to develop an excellent industry when profits actually begin to be seen in space enterprises in the first quarter of the 20th century. The problem with that message right now is that you have to, first of all, you have to finally bump up against a bad word in public circles these days, and that's called industrial policy. Industrial policy means government and business cooperating in strategic industries to promote the infrastructure and the favorable business climate to, to make money in those industries in the long-term future. It is exactly the policy that every other industrial country of the world is pursuing, to some extent valuably, and some extent I think they're, they're hurting themselves. But the appropriate, the balanced view of industrial policy may be part of the U.S. response to international competition. I, for one, propose, as much as possible, space as an industry that has ultimate long-term potential well into the 21st century, far beyond the computer industry, even far beyond other kinds of industries that we might think of, which may have the potential in 10 or 20 years, but the 21st century's money could, in fact, be made in, the, in, in space. So constituency support is going to be a function of being able to sell that message, that space is not just a place for putting astronauts in, in, on, uh, on the moon. Not a space, obviously, anymore for competing necessarily with other countries on space spectaculars. But indeed, putting investment into an industry <coughs> in the long run where our children, our grandchildren, and the future of the country's business opportunities are. And I urge you, and I would appreciate any questions, comments, indeed objections. Objections are always the most fun. Uh, to be able to, to talk about that. So let me turn it back to Bill. Yeah. Thank you for giving us a rundown as to what the Texas crazies are going to do with their money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to do two things. I said to the speakers I'd give them two minutes advance warning if they want to be out of the room before the break. Al, you now have your two minutes advance warning. We're going to take a couple, three questions, then we'll take a break. And then we're going to be back here promptly at 10.15 because if you're late, you're going to miss some of the pearls that Mike is going to give us. So questions, please. Uh, Dr. Bishop, is there any um, like a published paper on these? Uh, yeah, uh, like I said, any cards and notes that I get this morning, you'll get a copy of them. So please pull out your cards. I, I apologize for not having them with me, but I couldn't carry them all with me. Second question. I'm from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Yes, right sir. now we're seeing a lot of layoffs right. uh, due to cutbacks. We all know what's going on at the Johnson Space Center. Isn't relying on the federal government what's killing Texas economy right now? Um, yes and no. There, every industry has its ups and downs. The chemical industry is, uh, is a boom and bust industry. We relied on that as well. The government is now cutting back. Where are those people going to go? They should not go back in. What I'm, what I'm talking about is not more government contracts. 
by a, a government business cooperation to put that talented workforce to work in the new industry in aerospace, which we believe is the space side. Up till now, it's been the aero side. And so to move those people more into a space orientation rather than an aircraft and aviation orientation. That's probably going to take a, some kind of restructure. Probably is, but the, the people at the workshop said this is, they were recommending this is what needs to happen, and it can only happen when government and business cooperate over long-term industries. I mean, the United States is the only industrial country in the world where government and business are on opposite sides of every issue. We never work together. Government doesn't want, doesn't want to give business any money because they think they're all greedy. Business doesn't want government involved because they think all they're going to do is regulate them out of existence. There is an appropriate form of cooperation, and that's what we're trying to create in the United States in the 1990s to be able to work together to compete in the international economy. I believe space is an excellent domain in which to build that because we already have a civilian infrastructure, we have a growing uh, uh, entrepreneurial and large business interest, and it might be a good one to put that together. One more? Yes, sir. Uh, when government gets into these areas, there is great danger that they will pick the wrong technology or the wrong structure, etc. Right. Examples are several governments picked dirigibles as the uh, airline method of the future. Right. So, and they would have picked, for automobiles, they would have picked steam engines and batteries if they had gotten into it, right. rather than internal combustion engine. In the case of electricity, governments would have picked Edison's DC distribution system rather than Tesla's AC distribution system. The examples go on and on. Um, but on the other hand, government did pick aviation and government did pick microelectronics and computers. The question is not which you pick. Every time you pick, you take a risk of being wrong. The question is not picking. And not picking has the potential of so, so much working on the short-term problems that the long-term industries are defaulted to somebody else. One problem with government also is that government primary motivation is political. It is not technical or real-world motivation. Right. Sure. And, and therefore, it is not that, all right, uh, political and economic both have to work together. If they can't, then, then I have grave reservations about the position of the US economy. Now, on the other hand, the perfectly laissez-faire system People making business decisions in the short run and, and for their long-term interest might be exactly that system. Uh, but if we do that, it's not that we're not picking. We're picking a system to, to put our benefits on against other systems which in the last 10 or 20 years have, have indeed shown themselves to have higher growth rates and have been able to pick the right technologies and do very well. So it's a, it's a decision that we have to make one way or the other. We can't not decide. Any other questions? Having squared the circle, we will take a 10-minute break. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good presentation.